Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. I think a couple other people will shuffle in uh, in the next few minutes, but to maximize time, we'll get started. Um, my name is Mikey Mahenna, and I'm really honored to have uh, Maya Mumni and Hatim Iman on the call. Um, Maya is uh, based in Beirut. Well, both are based in Beirut. She's the creative uh, director of and co-founder of Studio Safar, um, a art and design studio um, based in Beirut that works with clients all over the region. She is a uh, uh, instructor at Alba. Uh, her work has been featured in uh, all over Europe and the Middle East um, in publications such as It's Nice That, Monocle, Vogue, Brown Book, Harper's Bazaar, and various others. Um, Hatem Imam is a visual artist and graphic designer. He holds a BFA uh, from AUB, what both of them do, um, and a master's in arts in uh, in fine arts from the University of Creative Arts in Canterbury. Um, he's a co-founder and creative director of Studio Safar as well, and uh, the and editor-in-chief of Journal Safar, and co-founder of Samandal. Um, he's involved in uh, the design world as well as the music world, which we'll talk about later. Um, so please, a huge round of applause, a, a muted round of applause <laughs> for our, <laughs> our, our two guests. Um, thank you so, so, so much for joining us. It's really an honor to have you guys on the, on the call. Thanks for inviting us, Mikey. Thanks for inviting us. Uh, I'll get started with just a, a broad question, and uh, I can start with you, Maya. Um, in looking through your bios and looking through the stuff you work on, you guys work on a lot of things at the same time. Is that something that limits you? Is that something that, you know, I was, I was writing notes and I was saying that it's like, it's almost like cross training, like cross creating. It, it, does it work different parts of your, uh, your mind, different mental muscles? Like what is your approach to that? Were you always like this or is this something, an intentional choice? Um, you're right. We do. And, uh, this is something that we, you know, talk to students a lot about or young designers, um, especially those that are, you know, you know, going through internships with us or, or just employed with the studio. But, um, research is like really at the core and at the heart of the, 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 the start of any project. Um, and like you said, because we work on so many different types of projects, like Today we're working on an arts and culture organization. Tomorrow we'll be working on a cybersecurity agency. Um, the most important thing for us is to like, you know, really know what the business is about before we start working on it. Do you guys feel like, um, and Hatem, you can answer this. Do you guys feel like you have a, like a suffered voice that, is, that isn't muted and is like supposed to be heard for every project, every client you have? Does that voice come through? Um, I think, you know, like it's, yeah, definitely the, the, this thing, you know, like I, I like the, the way you're calling it voice, you know, a lot of people kind of like say uh, you have a particular style and I'm, I'm not convinced of that word. I don't think that we have a necessarily a style or a signature, um, especially when, it, when we're talking about like visually how things look like, yeah. um, I think, but, but the, the idea of having a voice is, is something that's quite, that, that, that fits really well, if you want, with with our vision of the studio, and what's the role of design and designers? Uh, what, what really is the role of, of designers? Um, so, so I, I'll say yes to, to that. Um, my, I would assume you you agree with that. I do. That, yeah, like it seems is it, is that something that has evolved? Like I, I'm always curious about agencies that have that have partners and partnerships. How did you guys get to know each other? How did you meet? Where was, you know, how was Safa born? Um, so Hatem was actually my, one of my teachers uh, while I was studying at AUB. Yeah. Um, and we got to know each other then. We worked on so many projects together, freelance projects. We started a furniture business together. Um, and at that point, um, AUB had a, a, a job opening for a full-time professor in the design department. Um, and Hatem was applying and he, you know, you have to write like documents and fucking essays and whatnot. And he didn't get it. Um, and, and one of the things that he was, uh, uh tackling in his, in his, uh, proposal was to kind of bridge, um, the practices of fine arts and graphic design 
And when he didn't get it, he was really upset and he was really counting on it. And I said, well, why don't you practice what you preach and open up a design studio? And he was like, you know, I have no idea what business is and how to open up a studio. And I said, we'll partner up with somebody who can show you how to do that. Um, and so, uh, he spoke to a friend of his that had a business background and then he just said, well, will you open the studio with me? And I said, yeah, I will. And that's, that's how we did it. How, how soon into that process did you guys say, not only are we going to be a, a design agency, a design studio that works with clients, we're also, also going to self-publish our own, you know, our own publication, not for commercial purposes, just for creative purposes. How quickly did you come to that decision? I mean, I think that this was, you know, like something that we've been kind of dreaming about even before uh, opening the studio. Yeah. Um, and it was, you know, like we were, we, we knew that we had, uh, you know, like a, an urge and a passion for publishing. And we, you know, like as soon as we started the studio, we thought, you know, like this is exactly the right uh, environment for us to to start something like this. To um, Because, you know, like st starting this magazine was on one hand about, you know, like publishing and making public, you know, like all of this uh, knowledge on one hand, but also it's about research. It's about us doing, you know, like also research and not being constantly answering client briefs, basically. Yeah, it's, it, it's like a venue to be a little, like a little <laughs> uh, closeted academic, basically. It's yeah. It, 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 partly, it, yeah, it does, of course, touch upon academia on one hand, but it's not only yeah. that. I think, you know, like, there's also, there's something very popular about it as well. I mean, you're, you're really making something, you know, spreading, spreading this, this information across, you know, like, continents and... and uh, yeah, interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not, uh, yeah, I mean, we try as much as possible to... This is one of our aims, basically, is to bring, you know, to take out the conversation from the strict uh, closed circles of academia. Because, you know, like, there is a lot of great work that's being done in academia, but it's all, you know, like, inaccessible, you know, on JSTOR and other, you know, like, uh, 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 you know, specialized uh, journals and what have you. And it's not something that's being read by 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 the masses. Of course, I mean, like, I'm not claiming that what we're doing is being read by masses of people, but this, this you know, like, opening it up is, is quite important for us. I heard you guys, uh, in an interview, you were talking about, um, Maya, I think you had mentioned this, speaking about not this most recent edition that just came out now about migrants, but the previous edition, about how you guys have a specific bent for the journal or the magazine to be speaking to designers specifically. And which I found really interesting because I'm not a designer. Um, and I, and in some ways I, I think it's speaking to me as well, but, um, I was curious who is, who is the desired audience? Who are you really, who's the prototypical audience when you're, when you guys think about crafting the content, bringing in contributors, who are you speaking to? You know, like well, a, a business way would uh, saying it would be, what, what does success look like? Who, who picks it up? What do they take away? The hardest thing for us with the magazine is to reach the, the audience that we want to reach. I mean, for us to be able to change the conversation mm -hmm. on design um, and the misconception and, 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 and all of that stuff, we need to reach people beyond designers. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, just to give like a very personal example, my parents don't actually know what I do for a living. <laughs> um, and so... I, ideally, I would like the magazine to be accessible enough without it being, um, without it being really like, you know, short, swift articles here and there, uh, like clickbait stuff, but be, be, uh, be accessible enough to, you know, be picked up and read by people who aren't in the arts world or in the design world or, do you mind if I'd be a little cheeky about this? Cause I I'm curious what your answer is. I think I might know what it might be. Why? Like, why do non-designers need to know what designers are doing? I think I might know why, why but I'm, I'm curious. I might be wrong. Um, Mikey, a, 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 a big 
issue that we face as yeah. one of, of the issues we face as, as a design studio or as designers, whether we're an agency yeah. or we're freelancers or whatnot, is getting credit for the work that we do and for people to understand, you know, what, what the role of a graphic designer really is. I mean, yeah. there's so many different types of graphic designers, right? There's, there's graphic design for catalogs, for supermarkets, for then there's, you know, the graphic design that kind of like merges into visual, visual, um, uh, visual arts, um, and then there's editorial design work, and there's uh, you know the list is endless. Sure. Um, with other fields in design, like product design or architectural or fashion, you know what the designer is doing. They're doing the architect is designing the building, the fashion designer is designing the clothes, the product designer is designing the piece or the furniture, or or, or it's very clear. But if we were to take an, a project like a publication. Yeah. Say it's like a publication four hundred pages or five hundred pages. Our role as designers in this publication is almost that of uh, co-editors, because we're not only um, laying out the text and the images for the client or for the publisher. We're um, we're changing the way that the content is being read. So I can take an image and place it on the left side, and take the text and place it on the right. Exactly. I mean, Hatem can talk about this a little bit more. This is a perfect example of, of, of why this conversation needs to happen and why this perception needs to change. Um, and the only way to do that is to get people to understand what graphic designers do um, is to, to make this content accessible to them. And this is really important because, uh, you know, if, 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 if somebody wants to hire designers and they know what they're dealing with, they know what their, what their role is going to be, they know what to expect, and then they can probably pay them more fairly than they do. Um, that's something that we struggle with a lot in Lebanon, you know, like payments and whatnot. And um, sometimes the, 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 the idea that the client has for our role does not merit the cost that, that, that we, you know, submit in. And so, yeah. first and foremost, that's why. It's, it's, it's curious because like what you're, this, this, what you're saying sounds, um, sounds like you're also trying to empower, you're both, you're both educators, you both instruct, te- you know, students right whether they're in the classroom or whether they're interns or whether they're young employees or regardless right the point you just made right now about the the impact and the power that designers have do you think that's known to young designers as well or are you also educating them to that fact it's really not known it's really really not known um so definitely that's a great question i'm curious about like going back to this voice that you guys have, right? You don't necessarily have a style, but you definitely seem to have something to say, right? With your designs. I, I, I really do think you have something to say, whether you're like advocating for it or suggesting things. Um, when you teach young designers, are you trying to get them to tap into that? Like, hey, what do you have to actually say? Is that part of the process or is it you're you know, teaching them as technicians? Actually, this is exactly what we're trying to do, you know, like on on every front, you know, like uh, whether it's inside the office or in the magazine or in universities or whatever. The the point is that, you know, like as a designer, um, you have a huge role to play um, within, you know, like this this realm of culture. Um, And unfortunately, design is, you know, like often dismissed as something that is kind of like just giving, you know, it's kind of like a part of the service industry where you're just, you know, like um, ticking boxes and making, you know, like, uh, I don't know, like uh, c- complying with, with uh, just, you know, like execution, executing basically. So the idea is that, no, you actually have a voice and you can use design to, to make this voice heard um, in so many different ways. It could be something as simple as, um, you know, like, uh, um, I mean, th- what, what I'm trying to say is that it doesn't need to be something as uh, uh, big as actually publishing yeah. a magazine. It could be something that, ha- that that you practice in your everyday life in, in, or in your everyday uh, um, design practice, basically. That, that philosophy needs to be sort of trickled down to everything you're doing, right? It's basically the opposite of the, the client is always right, you know? Like mm-hmm. this, this kind of uh, uh, attitude... Uh, um, which again is really something that that you feel is is uh, attached to the service industry. I, mm-hmm. I think this should not be the case. No, you know, like the designer has a has a say in everything that yeah. they're doing, and you know, like anyone should listen to to what the designer is saying. Um, uh, you know, be, not not because the designer knows everything, 
or not because the designer needs to be put on a pedestal. It's just because yeah. you know, if you treat your the, the designer that you're collaborating with um, as someone who is uh, uh, intellectually equal, then the work that this designer is going to produce for you is going to be so much better. You're going to you're going to benefit, and they're going to benefit, and you know everyone's going to be yeah, I'll be in this talk to you. What are what were some of the like earliest mistakes that you were very very <laughs> happy that you made early? What were some of the most useful mistakes? Because starting organizations, starting enterprises, paying people to print stuff, um, those all cost stuff, and usually there are lots of mistakes along the way. Some of them suck. Some of them are very useful. Are there any sort of useful mistakes? You're like, oh my god, <laughs> that needed to happen. I'm glad. I'm glad I, we learned from that. I would say several. I mean, I'll say a few, but Hatem, go ahead, please, because I probably won't remember all of them. One is to <clears throat> learn to charge for the time you spend doing research. Um, we never used to do that before, um, and with time, we were like, "Wait a second, maybe we should charge for this." So we started doing that, and actually, um, when you charge for it, it becomes you know uh, time that the client gives you to work on, um, and. Um, I would say on a client base, learning to uh, be selective with our clients, like learning to read the chemistry um, and identifying whether it's there or not, and if it's not, decline. Um, that was that was something that 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 was really important that we learned with time, and, and we didn't before, and we made so many mistakes. And yeah. um, Hatem, do you does anything come to mind? Um, yeah, I mean, like what I mean, basically, the, the second point is really about, you know, learning to say no. And yeah. it's so difficult. I mean, I know, like, for me personally, it's so difficult for me to say no. Um, and I think that I, I started learning this more and more from Maya, because she'd be like, I, I just don't want to work on this project. It's as simple as that, you know, like, you just very honestly say, from the get go. Um, and like knowing that you're not the right person for the project. No, for the project. It's not like we're dumping you. It's like, I'm not good for you. Like, Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, my, our uh, uh, previous partner uh, taught us something, our business partner, when, because when we started, we were four people, and now it's just uh, Maya and I. Um, but he taught he taught us something that actually you know like makes still until today a lot of sense you know like he said that you know like that there's a triangle when it comes to our mm -hmm. our industry so the the time the scope of work and the budget and these three things are interrelated you cannot exceed or or you know like you cannot change one of them without the other two being uh, um, yeah. affected and this is this is a huge thing you know like this is a huge thing i know this for a fact with every designer that i've met or i've worked with the the the, the question of time management and the appreciation of what time means in, in in creative industries at large i think is um is is a huge problem because you know like the typical scenario when we started the studio this used to happen all the time you know we would get a, a new project and we would basically uh, submit an offer that includes you know like a tentative timeline let's say three months and you know like a particular budget okay. and you know so many times we'd be you know like a year and two months into the project and of course you know like we're completely drained uh, yeah. on one hand, <laughs> emotionally and uh, psychologically, um, yeah. but also the problem that we never, you know, accounted for is that we actually lost a lot of money because you know you yeah, you, you, you you're getting still the same amount that you agreed upon at the beginning, but the project you know like lasted twice or three times the duration, which means you're paying your bills and your rent and whatever. So this is a problem that I see with every designer around me, you know, like the clients don't understand or don't, you know, like appreciate the fact that, you know, like you're, you're, you're giving them your time. This is, this is actually what we're giving people because we're not selling a product, you know, we're selling, you know, we're sitting and we're thinking together and we're coming up with yeah. solutions. But at the end of the day, it's really what you're giving is your brain power and your time. And then, you know, these things yeah. start to generate, you know, whatever actual physical manifestations uh, uh, would, would, would appear eventually. 
but you guys work reg- regionally. How how easy? And I know that last year or two years ago, you worked. I guess last year you worked at Man Design Week. How easy is it for you to sort of understand the landscape, the creative landscape of a new city, and try to, you know, understand how to build a brand and like be a collaborator with an organization in a city like Amman or a city like whatever, Muscat, uh, Dubai, a place that maybe you're not so familiar with. How do you, how do you actually do that? Because for me, I, I, I consider you guys to be community builders because you're helping create, create these spaces, create these flames that attract all these moths. How do you, how do you do that? I would say curiosity. Yeah. Um, Hatem and I are very curious about the design scenes in other um, countries and other cities in the region. Yeah. Um, and when we get an opportunity to, you know, participate in an event or, or a project, collaborate with somebody on a project or whatever, we'll take it. Um, but we usually, you know, spend a, a week or so in that city and, and meet people from, from the the design field or the art field or whatever and 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 curiosity will just take you places but also even like the the actual um, you know like our our field of work anyway requires us to be uh, constantly learning new things and constantly being you know like wearing new hats because yeah. I mean, again you know like if you are hired by i don't know like uh, like uh, like a hospital or by i don't know like a, a cook or by any any kind of person or product or brand uh, you need to become the expert on that brand or that service yeah. institution you need to understand the way it, in which it works which means that you know like one day you're you're looking into uh, uh, you know like DJs and nightlife and the next day you're looking at um, I don't know you know like uh, uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the some some other you know uh, a cultural institution or, or a musician or a, um, an artist or you know so, so you really need to, to constantly be um, learning new things, putting yourself in, in, in these new environments. Yeah, absolutely. Is it um, when you go into these new places? Like, uh, I mean, they're not they're not exotic. I'm not trying to say that they're they're brand new and there's nothing that you can port from here that you can't port from here to there. But um, is is it a, is it a challenge? Is it something that you have to overcome, or you're just like, well, I'll just fig- we'll just figure it out. It's the same thing as you know, like. Walk me through the Amman Design Week. Like, would you just approach that the same way that you would approach Beirut Design Week? Did you guys, did you uh, work with them or did, were you just there? No, we, we were invited, you know, we just participated in... Uh, oh, okay. It, it was yeah, Amman Design Week. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, like, uh, um, working in, in different cities is always, you know, like, so exciting for us. It's always yeah. such, a, such a thrill. Um, I mean, like, we have one uh, project that traveled quite a lot, um, which is the exhibition Past the Quiet. Past the Quiet, yeah. Curated by uh, Rasha Salte and Christine Khoury. So basically, this show actually opened in uh, uh, Barcelona, in the in Macba. Um, and, uh, you know, like, we were not even, Maya and I were not even there for installation. Uh, so our partner at the time and another... Um, uh, one of our designers, Farah, was was uh, basically there, and then it traveled. It went to Berlin, and it went to Chile, and it went to, you know, like so many. So, uh, and it had e- even like smaller iterations in other cities, um, and eventually it landed. Uh, the last show landed in, in Beirut. So, I mean, like being introduced to new ways of work, and you know, like people doing things in different ways, and you know, like literally being in a different space. Um, it's it's, uh, it's thrilling, and of course, you know, like in some cases, the, the, this comes with a lot of restriction. Um, but then, you know, like the challenge is, what do you what do you do with that? You know, like how do you make it work despite everything? Can you walk me through just like from a from a technical perspective, um, what a, cl- a collaboration like that would look like? You know, Maya alluded to the fact that you know you don't just if it's a four hundred page book or if it's a uh, exhibition this complicated. Are you guys involved from a, are you sitting down with Christine and co from a con, con, uh, conceptualized, from the sort of conceptualized phase? Or, you know, how does that actually work? At what point, sir, do you, do you get involved? Or uh, let me rephrase that. At what point would you like to get involved? Maybe that's the easiest way, because I know every project's different. 
I mean, I would say typically as early as possible, no matter from my eye. Yeah, same. I mean, not to just talk about specifically exhibitions, but any other project. I mean, when we start with a with a with a on a project with a client, it's usually, well, what do you want to do and why do you want to do it? Yeah. Um, and that's a question we didn't we didn't used to ask before. So just to, to answer back on that mistakes thing, we learned to start doing that. What, why are you doing this? Why is this product important? Um, how is it different from what's already existing? And we usually don't ask that question, but we started um, a few years back. Um, mm -hmm. And then it's like, okay, well, show me what you have, and then we you know, look at the con content together. Um, we give our, you know, whatever opinions we have or insight. Um, and then it just naturally turns into like a brainstorming session and it just starts from there. Um, what usually happens is we also like kind of um, edit the material with the client. So it's not just uh, the client giving us the content and saying, well, so this is what I want to include. No, it doesn't work like that. We have to look at the content together and decide together if it's going to work or not. And if it's, and if not, why, what needs to be added, what should be removed? How about we bring in something from a, a different um, a, a medium? Um, how about we collaborate with this illustrator? Um, that kind of thing. Can we talk just briefly about some of the side projects you guys work on, um, not necessarily side projects, they all seem to overlap, but Samandal being um, a project that preceded uh, Safar, but has continued to, um, continued to exist. Hatem, how do you manage both of, this, uh, both of these things at the same time, or all three of these things, you're also involved in the music industry. Um, how do you seem to juggle? Um, I mean, Samandal, uh, you know, I co-founded Samandal with uh, a bunch of friends in 2006. Um, it was the original idea of Omar Khouri. Um, and he came up to me and said, do you want to start a comics magazine together? Um, and at the time, I never, I, I ne never did uh, make a comic myself, but I was, you know, a reader. Um, so, I mean, th this, this project kind of like, uh, and it started growing and evolving and it grew and the team grew. Um, and after 10 years of, you know, like doing only, you know, like with this, with, with, with these, uh, with this group of people doing everything from, you know, like editing to designing to, you know, literally, you know, carrying the magazine from one place to another and, you know, distributing it and what have you. Um, eventually we, we, I got to a point where, you know, like with actually many, many of, of us from the from the first generation if you want uh, there was a there was a younger generation who uh, started to uh, who joined our team um, and we're so happy about their enthusiasm and everything uh, that they are bringing into the magazine that or it's not only a magazine but it's an it's an actual association like it's an NGO mm -hmm. um, so we basically took the back seat and so now I'm not uh, any more uh, um, an editor in the magazine, so I don't get involved in the day-to-day -day things, but I'm, 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 you know, like still one of the co-founders. And every once in a while, you know, like, so the studio um, has designed the past two issues. So the one that we see that's animated down there, yeah. um, um, and the one that, 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 the latest one. So it, you know, like, so I'm, I'm, I still get involved in other, in other ways. Um, and actually the next book, the, the next anthology that's going to come out in 2021 is going to be, uh, I'm going to be co-editing, uh, co uh, that issue with Mazen Kerbesh. So it's uh, kind of like, we're both, uh, uh, editors in chief of that particular book, um, and in terms of juggling, yes, of course. I mean, like as I said, you need to. Um, I mean, definitely, uh, Studio Suffer takes up, you know, maybe seventy percent of my time, and then the rest is between teaching. Uh, Samanda doesn't take that much uh, of my time anymore, but you know, like other things have have different kinds of priorities. It depends on you know, like the the. the um, the time of, you know, what, what, what's happening at the time. I think that as a studio or as like a collective, everyone at the studio, mm -hmm. um, there's Hatem's WhatsApp status is turned on by possibility. And I really feel like everyone at the studio is just constantly turned on by possibility. Just the, 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 the idea of like us being able to publish our own magazine or being able to collaborate with, you know, somebody we've been a fan of or a client approaches us with a really interesting idea for an exhibition, which we're currently working on. Um, these these possibilities are really what drive us. Um, just knowing that you can curate an exhibition, you can become a musician, you can DJ, you can you know. It's just like so motivating to know that you can do 
over. Yeah. And in some ways you guys are cursed because you're great designers. And so things look nice, right? So like at the end there, there's a bow on them and people think nice things are easy as well. Um, but they're like, they're never easy, right? They're all, <laughs> nothing, nothing that is like beautiful is easy, right? Every single ballerina underneath their be- beautiful little ballet shoes have the nastiest toes ever, right? There's just pain and grit. Um, but is that, is that part of the seed or is that part of the fruit? You're excited about that. Definitely. I mean, like there is a, there's a great sense of achievement, you know, like if you, yeah. if you're being faced with, you know, something that's so difficult, uh, you know, like to solve or to, to, to crack or to achieve. Um, and when you, when you actually make, you know, when you do it, 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 it of course it feels, um, fantastic. Um, and I think, you know, like the, the, the most exciting thing is when, you know, like the, this, these things only happen when there is, there's actual there's actual collaboration between you know us as a studio and whoever we're working with whoever we're collaborating with because you know like otherwise this is not something that we can that we can pull off to, uh, alone and this, yeah. this means that there, there is a huge amount of trust mutual trust there's a huge amount of risk taking you know like willingness to to um, to, to try something, uh, uh, you know, to, to do something crazy. And then, you know, when it works, it's, it's always fantastic. Well, um, I'm going to ask you just before I open it up to everybody, um, since this is a, like a community of nerds, um, if you guys have any recommendations for people to check out besides obviously the stuff that you're working on, um, it doesn't necessarily have to be a book, a museum, uh, a fellow nerd or a, a film or music, but anything that you guys have been consuming or uh these days or in the past that you can recommend i i was introduced recently to uh this new engine that is provided by google the google culture thing and you can literally you know like go in and find i mean i'm i'm you know like completely fascinated by by uh, printmaking and by etching uh, yeah. so you can find you know like a rembrandt and you can you know like zoom in into like the minute details of it really you, yeah yeah and you can look at you know like the, the 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 painted you know frescoes of the ceilings in the churches in rome um the, the, it's it's an insane kind of um uh, archive and there are also crazy ways in which you can you know um, search it so there's for example one of the one of the ways in which you search is through color so you pick a particular hue of pink let's say um, and it shows you you know like thousands of paintings where this color is pre- is predominant so like it's it's an amazing um, platform that's crazy yeah, a client showed it to us um, actually once after a meeting, and the the entire studio just spent the rest of the half of the day. <laughs> Those are all billable hours, by the way. Those are all billable hours. <laughs> <laughs> Maya, anything from you? Um, I just wanted to say, in terms of like challenge. Um, what turns me on is also uh, not just a client who can challenge me, but a client who is also who also gets turned on by by being challenged. Yeah, that's, um, awesome. that's always a recipe like for a great collaboration. Okay, cool. I'm going to open it up to everybody. Um, while I do that, I'll just leave this up in case you guys are not following them already. Um, so the order of questions for now, if you can limit it to one question at a time, just so we can get as many voices as possible. I think we're going to start out with Lana and then Rami is next. So Lana, if you can unmute yourself, that would be great. I was asking, what are the key ingredients to opening a design studio, especially in the Middle East? And how does that differ from starting a publication in the region? You got or money? is the same as? I got money? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, other than money. <laughs> we, we started with no money, remember? We, we never had money. Yeah. We still don't, so. Yeah. <laughs> we must know. Yeah. <laughs> thanks, uh, thanks, Lana. It, it, uh, I would say that you know, like it really depends on 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 what you want to do with the, with either a studio or or a magazine. Um, I mean, for us personally, it's it's a question of you know, like 
being very passionate and very stubborn about you know the things that we want to achieve and trying to to you know it's 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 just you know like being very persistent and 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 i guess passionate and stubborn because i mean we you know like you could if you want uh, uh, to start a design studio to make money uh, then you probably need you know like completely different things but um, if it's about you know like doing things that you believe in then you just need to put in all the all the time and the persistence into it yes yeah um rami you're up next if you can unmute yourself uh, hey guys, um, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, thank you to Afikra as well. So my question is to you guys at, at uh, Safar. Um, I'm working on an article myself about nostalgic media in Lebanon. You know, there's many uh, Instagram pages, Facebook pages uh, centered around like images of nostalgia and pictures from, you know, the pre-war and so on. It's It's a very big thing, it seems. And I would love to see your perspective as to why nostalgia is such a prominent theme and aesthetic in, in Lebanese arts and media and Arab world as a whole, uh, of course, but it's mainly Lebanon. I think that there is really uh, very little documentation on um, like the history of visual culture in the region and specifically, I mean, if we're talking about Lebanon, then then documentation of, of, of the visual culture in Lebanon. Um, and these Instagram accounts that are popping out are almost like the only um, archival platforms that we can access without paying a fee or, or visiting a library or, 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 or. Um, and for, for me particularly, nostalgia in, in, in visual culture is uh, a really interesting topic because, um, you know, like, uh, um, old documentation of, of old manuscripts or the works of designers in the region from the 70s or the 80s is usually looked at as kitsch um, and it's um, and it's uh, and the importance of this work is often overlooked or not studied um, and and if you want, this is one of the reasons why we started the magazine, magazine to begin with and, and dedicated the entire last issue uh, to this theme. I think it's a little bit also dangerous, you know, like, uh, you know, to, to think about things only from a nostalgic uh, perspective. Um, you know, like this, this yearning for something that, um, you know, many people have, have not necessarily even lived or... Um, it. it it, there, there is there is a bit of a danger of kind of like flattening things, and you and we see this. Yeah. I mean, I, you, we notice this. Let's say, in um, in Lebanon, there is kind of like a return um, in 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 popular culture. You know, like if you see all of these new restaurants that are called, uh, you know, sandwich unosu, uh, etc., and they all have you know like images of uh, sabah and. You know, like they just have like these '60s and '70s posters and colors and graphics and whatnot. But I, I, I feel like there's there's a bit of you know like a fetishism around this, and it's not real. You know, it's not like what Maya was saying, where you know you're looking at the past and learning from it. You're just trying to kind of like get the the outer layer of what this past looks like, um, and you're devoiding it of of whatever meaning it it had um, by turning it into something that is you know like a pastiche. Or, or, you know, like just simply uh, kind of like an empty shell of, of, what, of the things that, that used to be. Uh, so I think it's, it's a double-edged sword. I mean, of course, we're all, we all feel nostalgic and we all feel this yearning for things that have happened before. But it's also, it's important not to get completely like washed away by, by this feeling and not, and not look, look critically. Yeah, there's a, there, I feel like there's a little bit of um, like a Make America Great Again um embedded into that and um you know one of my favorite designers printed this poster and somebody gave it to me and said make lebanon great again and and i was like man like a, a like a beautiful pop arty version of sabah can be on the walls but it's hard to put like an armenian genocide on the wall like it's hard to put other stuff on the wall so like mm -hmm. let's um Okay, I think um, Nadia is next. Thank you for hosting this talk. It's been really interesting. Um, my question is regarding the brainstorming be 
behind the themes of uh, Journal Safar. I think the themes are really interesting and exciting, and I'm just wondering where you draw your inspiration from and the brainstorming process um, to to get to those themes. I mean, that we, we were asked this, uh, this question um, uh, on a past interview, and really the, the, the answer is that, it, you know, things just kind of like um, pop up because of probably, you know, like an accumulation of things or circumstances that led us to think about certain ideas. Uh, so it kind of like sometimes feels like you just wake up and you're like, oh, this is the new theme. Um, or, you know, hey, Maya, what do you think of this as the new theme? Or, hey, Hatem, what do you think of this as the new theme? And we go with it. It just feels right. Uh, but I think it's, it's, it's typically, you know, like because things have happened or have been happening or, you know, that we've been looking at things or, or we have questions around a particular area uh, that kind of like ripen in the back of our head and eventually they, they just, you know, appear. I, I think that they also have to do with, of course, I mean, like they're related to current events, you know, like when we're talking about migrations, then, then obviously it's a response to, to whatever is happening, happening around us in the world right now. Yosef, um, you're up next. I don't know if you're still Hello. on the call. Yes. Well, oh, yeah. Great. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks again for uh, having this talk and uh, sure. for hosting the guys. And uh, your um, your work is very interesting. I'm just going to get straight to the question, which is, um, in terms of capturing an audience that is not in the design world, how do you tackle the issue of simplifying the design language um, and appealing to your audience without losing the idea? And also, what is your opinion of incorporating more fiction uh, within your publication as a way to communicate with the audience? Thank you. Um, with a lot of difficulty, Yusuf. Uh, I don't think we've, <laughs> I don't think we've uh, managed to do this successfully yet. Be it in um, in simplifying the language to to make the content more accessible to people who don't know this language. Um, but we're trying, and it's like it's. I mean, my answer with that would, to that would be trial and error, and you know, focus groups, and 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 be open to like getting feedback from people that aren't in your immediate circle. Um, yeah, I'd love to incorporate fiction within the magazine. We we have in the in the new issue uh, three short stories by Miranda July actually that have been translated to Arabic for the for the very very first time. Um, okay, so Rasha says her mic isn't working. Um, what would your advice be for somebody wanting to start their own independent publication? I think you you answered this already. Um, if you want to add anything. Uh, Go ahead. Otherwise, I can pull up the next person. I'll just yeah, I'll just reiterate by saying uh, by telling Russia, just do it. And yeah. I, I can add one one thing um, yeah. is to to be as specialized or as focused as possible. You know, like don't don't make you know like a you know like a broad general thing. You know, like be very, very like the more specific you are, the the better. And this is something that we're learning also over time. Yeah, no, I was just saying that, you know, like, if you look at the first uh, three issues, let's say, um, the, 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 I think that the, it was quite wide, you know, like the spectrum of the kind of content that was published. And we are now starting to, 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 to focus more. And this, this is exactly what happened, actually, with uh, Samandal Comics. It used to be, you know, like all over the place. And then eventually we realized that actually, no, you, we need to have an editorial voice. We need to, to take this, you know, like somewhere. Yeah, it goes back to something Maya said earlier about like saying no, you know, like figuring out who you are. Like this is who, this is precisely who we are. Yeah. We do this, and yeah. and this is fun for us. Um, okay, Muhammad is up next. And uh, hey guys, thank you very much for everything you said. It was pretty interesting. I had a question, and I came up like something else came on my mind. So I'm just gonna try and make it really quick. So. I would hear your opinion on both. Uh, the first one was uh, about what Hatem was talking about. I'm interested to hear your thoughts on being like a designer, which are mentally drained, uh, and the mental health ramification that can follow from coming um, from what you said about the real price that designers pay, which is their time, their mind, uh, and sometimes they're also their social lives, uh, since they are preoccupied with doing something for three months sometimes. And the second question comes from uh, something we talked about uh, before about uh, 
uh, graphic designers, not, uh, people, clients not understanding how much they uh, work uh, or how to value them. Do you consider unionization of the of graphic designers or designers in general, like in a country, would help with that or not? Um, I mean, in terms of like the first question in relation to mental health, um, I think that you know, like this is you know, like I don't, I don't, I don't think that this is related to design particularly or to the magazine or what what not. But I think that mental health is something that is so neglected in our part of the world, and there is so much stigma around it, um, and that I feel like it's a huge, you know, like this is one of the the biggest probably one of the biggest problems that we we face you know like uh, i know that f for a fact you know like we have uh, i mean people are miserable there's a huge you know like you know there, there's a lot of youth suicide there's you know like so many so many i mean i, mean, I don't know where to start where talking about mental health but it's something that you know like everyone should um take very good care of and you know like address i don't know if my you want to add anything to to that maybe you can you can you can yeah I, I would like to add to that actually i, th I think that um if i understand correctly i think the 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 link that hamad is drawing to design is when a client mentally drains you um and i would say that um when you can locate that, just make sure to prioritize that and put yourself first. So, you know, I mean, it's happened to all of us and it happens to all of us, actually. Um, you know, when you're working for a client and the client is either uh, overtaking you or, or, or being very dismissive, dismissive of your time or your... Um, your uh, your work or your advice or and you feel like you are just being dragged into the rest of this project and you just do not want to work on this um just put a stop to that put your foot down uh Maisa? hi guys thank you so much this has been such an interesting conversation um my question is like when i when i look at your work there are aspects of it um where i can see a lot of similarities to like really pioneering poster art and magazines from the 60s and 70s. Like the region has such a rich history of interesting graphic design um, with posters and magazines specifically. And I'm just wondering, has any of this influenced you guys or are there any other historical references which have had an impact on your work in any way? Always, always. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, this is this is the you know like the idea of of researching, of looking, you know, not only uh, in the past but also in in you know geographically looking at different places, looking at at also things coming from completely different uh, fields, you know, like whether it's from the arts or the music or I don't know, uh, getting inspiration from all sorts of different kind of uh, uh, movements or. Uh, um, you know, like they, they could even not be related to the creative industry altogether. I mean, sometimes you know, you get inspired by by food, or <laughs> so. So yeah, but I mean, the, the the idea about you know, like what what you're talking about in relation to um, you know, like particular, let's say, posters or whatnot. I mean, of course, this is you know, like this is this should be part and parcel of of our. Um, of our work process is to to look at our heritage and to understand it, to see you know like how it evolved, you know where do these letters come from, where do these motifs come from, where does this illustration style come from, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and to to learn from that because you know if you don't learn from the past then you you, you can't uh, evolve. Before we close out, um, thanks for all the questions, everybody. Yeah. Um, and uh, if, if you want to find these people, you can find them uh, across any one of these uh, <laughs> Instagram accounts. Um, it was a huge, huge pleasure uh, to have you guys uh, be a part of this event. And I, I really want to thank you for generously giving your time and being so generous with the questions. Um, if you want to stay on uh, and give me some feedback, uh, I'll stay on for a little bit. But... Uh, otherwise, um, thanks so much to everyone for joining, all the questions, and especially to my and Hatham. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mikey, for having us. It was really great. And thank you for everyone's questions and for being here. Okay, everybody. Um, have a great day. 
I hope you have AC wherever you are. Uh, <laughs> bye, guys. Bye.